I'm returning here a quarter century after I first came to Dhanbad. Some things about this place have changed, but many things have not. On the surface, Jharia and Dhanbad district in the state of Jharkhand in eastern India looks like a typical mining town. Haphazard construction, damp, decaying, lime-covered buildings crisscrossed with congested streets filled with monsoon slush. The coal dust hangs in perpetual Perpetual smog in the air. And there is the constant clanging of machinery. That is where the comparison stops. Beneath the terra firma here rages a fireball. Jharia's underground fires threaten the existence of over 400,000 people in the township. And this threat becomes more real day by day. Jharia coalfield is unique in many ways. Let me take, talk about its geological structure. There are 40 coal seams, which contains, which is the storehouse of India's prime cooking coal. And again, it is extremely rare in India to find the quality of coal that you have in Jharia. And that's why the focus is on recovering as much coal as possible. The second characteristic which makes Jharia coal field unique is the intensity of exploitation that it has undergone in the past and in the recent past and difficult working conditions with multi seam section workings, thick seams, problems of fires, inundations and half as that development. Like it is impossible to relocate the railway lines practically, lay out new arterial roadways and all the planning that has gone in so far has been a little lopsided. And Jaya Coalfield compares with the best or the worst in terms of its complexity to coal mining areas in Czech Republic, in some parts of China, in some parts of Pennsylvania in the United States. But it is, it suffers all the malaise that hits any coal field which is old and ancient. This has got the highest coal density of any coal fields in the world. That means in a given thickness, the coal seam content is very high in Jharia coal field. Secondly, in the Indian context, uh, Jharia coal field has got a unique place in the sense that it is the only source of prime cooking coal in the country. And another important thing is that Jharia coal field is now producing coal for over 100 years. This coal field is one of the most complex coal field of the world. And to run this coal field will require high degree of technical skill, high degree of dedication, high degree of management power management skill. Now, there have been situations where there has been violations of the law. Some have been intentional. Some has been as a result of working in this type of environment. It is unique because in no coal field probably you will find so many burning sites of fire anywhere in the world. And it is unique because in, some, in these areas also we are mining coal and quite successful. Jharia coal field is unique because mining started in the 19th century and the town, township of Jharia was built on the coal field right from day one. Instead of having a, a peripheral township, the dwellers connected with mining who did business in mining and even the lords of mining, they lived on the coal fields. In that sense, it's unique. And that's why it's a serious problem today. Well, well, I agree with you that this place is one of the most polluted places in the country. That's true, because of two reasons. A, there's a concentration of 70 mine fires 
in an area of 400 square kilometers, which is very high by any standards. In the world? 400 square kilometers, there are 70 fires. I mean, this is a record in the world? I think so. It would be. It would be. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't think there is any other place with such a concentration of mine fires. That's number one. So, if there are mine fires, you can imagine every time there will be a smoke. Second thing is the population density. You will not find any coal field with this kind of a population density. So many people settling over here. This 400,000 people is only a part of Jharia. I mean, it's not the full Jharia. It is only the people living in the endangered areas. The total Jharia population is more than a million. Underground coal fires are burning in different parts of the world. In the United States, Indonesia, South Africa, Australia, China, Russia and Germany. But the underground fires in Jharia are different. Many of these fires that you see here, some of them have been burning for almost a century. Unlike underground coal fires in different parts of the world, which have been caused by spontaneous combustion, most of the fires here are a consequence of unscientific mining. The first recorded instance of miners noticing flames leaping out of cracks and vents was in 1916 at the Bhanora Colliery in the Raniganj area. Since then, mining operations in at least 1,500 collieries have had to be abandoned due to underground fires. Over the last century, Underground fires have led to a loss of around 50 million tons of the best coal India possesses. Coal that should in an ideal situation be used only for manufacturing steel. But this does not tell us much about the overall scale of the loss if one considers environmental degradation and loss of livelihood. These wisps of smoke rising eerily to the sky day after day are a grim reminder to the inhabitants of the area of the murderous inferno that lurks beneath the very ground they walk on. This used to be a road once upon a time, but you can see the terrain the way it looks right now. This is coal. It's now white. It's burning hot and though it's raining right now, I can feel the heat beneath my feet. The most apparent damage caused by underground fires is land subsidence. The burning coal creates a vacuum underground, causing land to subside. Hundreds of buildings have collapsed. Railway lines have been closed down. 
These pictures are all that remains of railway stations that were once busy. अच्छा मैं एक सवाल आपसे पूछना चाहता हूँ ये जमीन के नीचे से आग जल रहे हैं आप यहाँ पे काम कर रहे हैं आप डर नहीं रहा है ये इसमें खतरा नहीं खतरा तो कुछ नहीं है गैस निकलता है यही लगता है थोड़ा गर्म लगता है यहाँ आग जल रहे हैं जमीन के नीचे तो आप आप डरते नहीं बिल्कुल इसलिए डर रहे हैं डरने की कोई बात नहीं है जान का खतरा नहीं बिल्कुल कुछ नहीं कोई खतरा नहीं बिल्कुल बिल्कुल नहीं आप ये वेल्डिंग का काम कर रहे हैं आप टेम्पो का काम कर रहे हैं यहाँ पे और जमीन के नीचे आग जल रहे हैं इसमें बिल्कुल खतरा नहीं है आप कह रहे हैं तो बात है कि धसने के लिए इसमें कोई गारंटी नहीं कि कब धस सकते हैं और इसमें है खतरा भी जानते पर क्या करेगा खतरा तो है See, right in front of me, there's smoke coming out. There's an underground fire beneath my feet. And next to it, not even two or three feet away, there are these two young boys repairing the engine of a vehicle. And if you just go down this road, you don't even have to travel 100 meters, there's a petrol pump. But for all intents and purposes, life is normal in Charia Township. Two-thirds of the energy consumed in India is generated by coal. Coal mining accounts for more than three-fourths of the total mining operations in the country. India is the third largest producer of coal in the world. Mining in Jharia started more than a century ago when the British came to this region in search of minerals. What they found was not only the best quality coking coal, they discovered that unlike most coal fields, the most valuable coal in Jharia was close to the surface. Thus began a long phase of mining. Much of the coal that was extracted by private mine owners was done in an unscientific manner, a euphemism for slaughter mining. The intention was to extract as much coal as possible with no thought for preserving the environment or the safety of workers. As demand for coal zoomed, especially during the Second World War, a law banning women from working underground enacted in 1938 could not be enforced by the British Indian government. The demographic profile of the area started changing dramatically. The labor migration pattern in Jharia coal fields can be divided into three phases. Clearly, you know, in the initial phase, it was the local labor, people coming from the neighboring villages, neighboring areas, mainly comprising of um, tribals, Adivasi labor, and um, lower caste groups like Baudis um, who came to work in the collieries. And uh, basically they were the people who cut the pits, you know, they, they dug the pits and they also worked underground um, as a family team most of the time, especially the Adivasi labor. The second phase comes with certain kinds of technological innovations and that is once underground mining you know, uh, becomes, uh, becomes the norm and uh, people have to go underground uh, and, uh, in the carriage and, and, and they, have to, they have to sort of cut through the seam. You know. That is when they require specific kinds of technology like Sometimes they use blasting, sometimes they use coal cutters, machine coal cutters. That is when there is a change in the, in the labor force. And the uh, upcountry labor, mainly coming from North Bihar and Eastern UP, you know, these people uh, begin to come in to work as slightly more skilled workers. And the third phase is after nationalization, you know, 
after nationalization in 1971, when you have a large scale sort of uh, eviction of the Adivasi uh, workers and replacement by uh, sometimes by uh, by up country again uh, North Bihar and uh, sort of Eastern UP people coming in to work. Also, people from um, from mafia gangs, you know, who were working as watch and ward staff, people who who used to sort of um, act as kind of um, the the hooligans of the of the colliery owners, you know, to maintain uh, law and order to sort of uh, dominate the workers. Some of them be become enrolled as workers. Although they don't actually do the work underground. This is a legacy that we are having from the British time. The, when I worked in coal mines, I saw that the slaughter mining had been, ta had been taking place during British time itself. The galleries, which should, have, should be about say 12 feet or 14 feet wide, there are 30 feet wide galleries, 30 feet high, such are the uh, uh, coal mines that I have seen. So s due to slaughter mining, the coal fires have taken place underground, not proper ventilation uh, because of the reasons that I think uh, you know. And uh, the whole uh, the topography, the life, everything of the Jodhia coal field has been uh, changed. Private mine owners are held responsible for the haphazard and rapacious mining that took place with no concern for the environment. At least eight independent committees of experts set up by the British government had recommended nationalization of coking coal mines before India became politically independent in 1947. Before nationalization, the private owners started the mining. They have not followed the rules and uh, they have started. And by illegal mining and uh, not following the mining rules, they have lost a lot of coal during easy way of extracting coal. It was for preventing unscientific mining, increasing output, and in order to provide better working conditions for miners, that the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and former Minister for Steel and Mines S. Mohan Kumaramangalam decided in favour of nationalisation. When nationalisation became imminent, almost overnight, the names of hundreds of people, including those of hoodlums, were hastily added to the roles of employees of private mine owners. कोलियरी में कुछ लोग जो काम करते हैं नेशनलाइजेशन के बाद कुछ अनाप सनाप लोगों को कि मेरी कोली जो थी उसमें हुआ कि अब ये तो सरकारी करण हो रहा है इसका तो जितना नाम इसमें खाते में घुसा सकते हो उस नाम को उसमें इंट्रोड्यूस कर दो और वो सारे लोग जो कभी नहीं थे वो आ गए और बीसीसीएल के पदाधिकारी हो गए जिनका जो क्वालिफिकेशन था उसके तरफ से कुर्सी दे दी गई देयर वाज अ लॉट ऑफ गोस्ट वर्कर्स इन द माइनिंग इंडस्ट्री पीपल who were present only on roles. Thanks to nationalization, when all this was rationalized, we found that there was a large segment of the mining workers who didn't exist. In fact, I did a study for the World Bank on, on rationalization of the manpower in coal industry. And I said that there must have been at least 10,000 people who didn't exist. A paradigm shift took place between 1971, since nationalization, and we witnessed a coal field almost like a boom town of historic days. So, coal field has seen massive infusion of money, massive infusion of technology, and the coal field literally metamorphosed. In a sense, all the vices that come in with money came in. And then, since 1985 onwards, it went into decline when coal production reduced, importance of the coal field reduced, the economy of the coal field suffered, and in the process, the huge 
growth of the market disappeared. In between, the production had surged and the coal industry went to cycles of recession, cycles of boom and today it represents the ghost town of the American gold town mines in Yukon or, or California. Despite the fact that the late Sanjay Gandhi had contended in his first ever interview in the now defunct Surge magazine that nationalization of coal mines was perhaps a wrong move, and despite the claims of former mine owners, almost everybody acknowledges that nationalization came rather late in the day and that there would have been no investments to control fires or to improve workers' wages had the union government not taken over the ownership and the management of coal mines in the country. Even before nationalization of coal mining in the early 70s, the government of India had started establishing public sector enterprises in this part of the country. In 1952, the tribal area of Sindri was selected as the location for the establishment of India's first large fertilizer plant in the public sector. While inaugurating the plant, the country's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, said he was not inaugurating a fertilizer factory but a temple of modern India. Words that were to be quoted over and over again. The factory in Sindri has been shut down since 2002. Its machinery is junk. Yet, during the decade of the 70s, the then undivided district of Dhanbad in the then undivided state of Bihar was the single largest recipient of funds provided by the union government in New Delhi to set up not just the Sindhi Fertilizer Plant and Bharat Coking Coal Limited, but also the Bokaro Steel Plant now under the Steel Authority of India Limited. Nehru's legacy was sought to be carried forward by his daughter Indira Gandhi. और राष्ट्र को के औद्योगिक विकास में जिनकी एक बड़ी भागीदारी है उनका जीवन बेहतर बने तो हुआ कि नहीं अधिक से अधिक खनन हो श्रमिकों का जीवन बेहतर हो इस दृष्टि से यहां कोल इंडिया स्थिति में और इंदिरा गांधी ने इसको इसके निजीकरण के इसको तोड़ते हुए तो जब निजीकरण को तोड़ते हुए एक लोक उपक्रम के रूप में अस्तित्व में आया तो लोगों को लगा कि अब इसका दिन बहुरेगा, इस क्षेत्र का दिन बहुरेगा, यहाँ के लोग और ज़्यादा खुशहाल होंगे। लेकिन उल्टा हुआ, उल्टा ये हुआ कि कल तक जो निजी क्षेत्र में लोग मालिक थे और जो उनके रखरखाव के लिए, उनके सुरक्षा में लगे हुए लोग थे, वो कालांतर में लोक उपक्रम के अस्तित्व में आने पर वो एकहत्तर के बाद समझिए कि ये भ्रष्टाचार का बाजार बहुत गर्म हुआ और इससे क्या हुआ कि जो काम होना चाहिए था उस वक्त कोयला खदान से निकल रहा था कोयला कोयला लोग मतलब जा रहा था कोई देख नहीं रहे थे कोयला चोरी पर चोरी हो रहा था
nationalization of coal mines took place very late. Yet, ironically, government control over the ownership and management of coal mines did not significantly improve the economic condition of the Dhanbad Jharia area. By the turn of the millennium, the finances of Bharat Coking Coal Limited were in a mess. Production had come down from 28 million tons in 1999-2000 to less than 23 million tons four years later. I joined in November 2003 and I found that this company is in the worst kind of crisis. No provision of replacements, huge losses. The losses were of the order of 600 to 700 crores a year. Huge cash losses, 300 to 350 crores of cash losses. And successive cash losses over a period of five years had led to accumulated liabilities of a staggering amount, 1,500 crores of staggering liabilities. Liabilities to pension fund and PF authorities, more than 360 crores which means at any point of time prosecution is possible. Employees were not getting their uh, retirement benefits in time, actually because I have not put money with CMPFs. So how can CMPF give the money to employees? Employees are only getting the net salary and that too with a delay of 20 to 25 days or 30 days. Even the employee's contribution to PF was not being deposited. It was being diverted to other working capital purposes. Suppliers had forgotten that they are ever going to be paid. The waiting time was more than two years for the suppliers to get paid. So we were on the lookout for benevolent suppliers who would keep on supplying, looking at the plight of BCCL, but the benevolent suppliers had disappeared. So that was the kind of situation where we are in. The CISF, we owed something like 250 crores to the CISF. They were every time threatening to pull out. BCCL had to be turned around. One part of the strategy was to stop recruiting. The total number of employees of BCCL came down from a high of 140,000 in 1990-91 to 87,000 in 2005-2006. This number is expected to come down further to 58,000 by 2011-2012 with an annual attrition rate of 5,500. What is the biggest problem of this area? The biggest problem of this area is the biggest problem of this area. The biggest problem of this area is the biggest problem of this area. And the biggest problem of this area is the biggest problem of this area. उसको सरकार ने बंद नहीं कराया और उसमें जो थोड़ा बहुत कोयला बचा हुआ है उसको निकालने के लिए गांव के युवक जो हैं अपने जान को जोखिम में डालकर 700-800 फीट नीचे जाते हैं और उनको मात्र 60 या 70 रुपया मिलता है इस इलाका का सबसे बड़ा समस्या है यहां पर रोजगार यहां पर दो तीन महीने जो खेतीहर जो धान का एकमात्र खेती होता है यहाँ और जिसके बदलो जो एक दो महीना काम बाकी नौ दस महीना ये लोग एकदम बेकार रहते हैं दिस इज देंस to the headquarters of Bharat Coking Coal Limited or BCCL. For the first time since its inception in 1971, in the year 2005-2006, the company earned a profit. We have made a sea change in the fortunes of this company by taking a couple of strategic decisions. And today what you find is a very different Dhanbad, a very different Jharia. At least if you meet the people here, they are getting salaries in time. All their PF dues have been cleared. The CISF dues are a matter of past. The suppliers are being paid just like any other company would have been paid. The company in terms of liquidity is in a far better position today. The company has been able to report its first ever profit in 2005-06 of a little more than 200 crores. What is the impression? Not only you see the condition of the people, but condition of the industrial area. What do you find? You find a picture of decay, not a flourishing picture of something is developing. You find a picture, see, of decay. The, all those col workers' colonies, they are deteriorating. Collierings are getting closed, one after another you find. The few things are moving like that. But how is it that colliery, the industry is decaying and the accounts, cost account, the accountancy of the uh, industry is flourishing like that. 
this is a very when it is a one of the biggest uh, rather problem or puzzle uh, which should to uh, involve the people because now if you go from here if you start you will find the in all most of the collieries are half closed you see and most of the collieries are in profit some 20 years back all the collieries used to run and they are in loss so the loss and profit of the coal company at least in this region which i found depends on the paper manipulation how they are manipulating the paper one of the most important changes that have taken place in this region over the decades is that bccl has been reducing its labor intensive underground mining operations and emphasizing open cast mining which is more capital intensive that you see this company was never in a position to provide employment to so many people i mean this so many people was never required for this company for its optimal operations we were running all kind of manual underground mines which can never be viable see the wage levels for example my earning per man shift each man shift costs 800 rupees today and in a manual underground mine i can't expect anything more than 0.4 as my output per man shift so if i pay 800 rupees for 0.4 tons You can see the wage cost is more than two thousand rupees. It's around two thousand rupees, and the coal sales are twelve hundred rupees. So I incur a loss of eight hundred rupees per ton on wages alone. I can't keep on running those manual mines. These are highly loss-making mines, and if this company has to survive, all that we need to do is we need to gradually phase out these manual mines. After mechanization of coal and nationalization of coal, the labor input. in mining became absolutely inconsequential 100 laborers were uh, replaced by about two laborers skilled laborers so the all the inhabitants who were miners earlier have become now degraded as far as their lifestyle is concerned anti social life and all sorts of vices have cropped in it's a tragedy and not only in jhoria everywhere in india wherever there has been mining and mechanized mining whether it is navally whether it is for anything the local dwellers are no longer involved in getting the dividends from the mining and they have become totally marginalized that's a big tragedy <laughs> underground mining employs more workers but losses mount open cast mining on the other hand is cost effective but destroys the environment open cast mining has a environmental cost only point is that environmental cost has to be properly mitigated You see, we have to lay a lot of stress, more stress, more emphasis on restoration of land, on reclamation and restoration of land to its natural thing. You know, as in the world they say that it must be a golf course. That's where we should bring back the land, which is not being done so far. I am I am aware of that, and that is definitely one of the areas of priority for not only BCCL for all coal companies. The land surface values have been totally lost. No vegetation. because you have a lot of smoke and toxic material coming out through the cracks and fissures heat so the vegetation has gone and a lot of subsidence of the land because of the shallow underground fires so that is the main effect on the environment is on the land on water similarly there is no water in the jhoria area which is potable or even usable in agriculture or irrigation but 
the coal field area, there is such a lot of burning of fossil fuels, it builds up gases in the atmosphere and even the Landsat images taken all around the world shows that these are red spots of heated up atmosphere, the coal field areas. And you know, in almost every mining area has this problem. But because of the underground fires, the problem is much more acute in the Jhoria coal field area. The huge ecological destruction that has taken place in this region has made one of its lifelines, the Damodar River, one of the most polluted rivers in India. The high levels of emission of methane and sulfurous waste have increased acidity to dangerous levels. The impact of coal mining has not been on the external environment alone. It has devastated the health of those who live here. Most miners and their family members have been regularly exposed to noxious toxic gases. The oxides and dioxides of carbon and nitrogen have led to bronchial and respiratory diseases. This woman seems far older than her actual age of around 40. She has been living near a fire area and has been suffering from respiratory ailments for two years. No doctor has visited her, nor has she been able to afford one. No doctor so, आपको कभी भी कोई डॉक्टर नहीं देखा है आपको तो दो साल से तकलीफ है कोई डॉक्टर नहीं देखा है यहां पैसा रहेगा 400 500 1000 रुपए तक हम लोग जो है इसका इसमें गैस जो निकलता है वो बहुत गंदगी महसूस करता है और उसे दमप परसेंट भी हो सकता है आदमी इससे ज्यादा गैस लगने के बाद में अस्वस्थ हो जाएगा और गिर जाएगा गिरने के बाद में उसका मौत हो जाएगी मान लीजिए परेशानी तो सर है ही है छोटा-छोटा बच्चे के ऊपर ज्यादा असर पड़ता है क्या असर मतलब कि खांसी खोकी मान लीजिए जो भी है फीवर आ जाता है ये सबसे परेशानी है जमीन के नीचे जो आग है उसके चलते जो तकलीफ है यहां का आदमी लोगों का वो सबसे ज्यादा है गैस की प्रॉब्लम है यही जो गैस निकलती है खूबी खराब खूनी गैस है वो बारिश होने के बाद ज्यादा निकलती है इसके चलते बच्चों का बड़ों का जो एजेड आदमी हैं जिसको हाइपरटेंशन या कुछ भी प्रॉब्लम हार्ट का प्रॉब्लम है उसको सांस लेने में काफी प्रॉब्लम होता है धनबाद झरिया कोल फील्ड में जैसे हम लोगों ने देखा है कि ये जो महीन धूल है हवा में भी है वर्क प्लेस में भी है तो इसके चलते कुछ-कुछ फेफड़े की बीमारियां जैसे ब्रोंकाइटिस ब्रोंकियल एज्मा ब्रोंकियटिसिस ये सब थोड़ा होता है माने फेफड़े की बीमारियां हपनी का बीमारी जिसे कहते हैं ब्रोंकियल एज्मा ये सब प्लस कुछ थोड़ी बहुत कोल वर्कर्स न्यूमोकोनियोसिस भी पाए जाते हैं और इसके अलावा ये जो पानी पानी का भी बीमारी यहां कुछ ज्यादा है वाटर बॉन्ड डिजीजेस जिसे कहते हैं जैसे आप लोग जानते हैं ये पानी के बीमारी जैसे पेचीस मियादी बुखार कैदस्त की बीमारी या जो भी पानी से और बीमारियां होती है ये सब यहां है while undernourishment in children is less of a problem in dhanbad in comparison to other parts of the region the children of miners suffer from a different set of diseases.
is a problem is respiratory tract infections and that is because of the not only dust because of the bad roads because the bad the bad roads the trucks and all the which are which are going there the sand spills out other things spills out and the whole atmosphere is full of these contaminants so you we have maximum if you go to the ward you will find about 80% cases of respiratory tract infection patients are full of uh, bronchopneumonia as small children and that is one of the, i think the major cause is because of the environmental pollution which is there because of the dust it is a total environment the moment you enter this coal field from an external area then you will find the dust the smoke smog and the smoke now the first impression that you will get is your choking of your lungs and you will find that why you have got really got it but if you stay here for days together if you stay here for years together you will become acclimatized to this type of environment and therefore when you go to the, your work also you will find that similar type of environment is working so what i am trying to really drive in that it is not the rules and the regulation alone that will answer the question it has to be attacked in a social framework environment alone does not kill violation of mining laws is a major killer mining accounts for only 1% of total employment the world over but nearly 7% of fatal accidents in the workplace In the Jharkhand area, an estimated 1,500 miners have died in more than 30 mining accidents over the last six decades. 800 miners have died in the decade of the 80s and the 90s. After the Chasnala accident, mining accidents almost became a part of the folklore. A popular movie starring India's best known actor was produced, for which a part of the shooting was done in Dhanbad. <laughs> Many of the scenes depicting a mining accident were shot in sets in Mumbai. As recently as the 6th of September 2006, 50 miners were gassed to death in an underground mine in the Nagda Colliery in the Bhatdi area in Jharia. The then chairman and managing director of BCCL, Partha Sarathi Bhattacharya, acknowledged that at least half the mines in the area did not meet basic safety standards. Many mines were functioning against the advice of the Director General of Mine Safety.
बस हो Before we talk of the violations of the mining law, we must really understand the spirit of the mining law. The mining laws of the country had been evolved over a long time through experience, through learning, through scientific inputs, and this evolution is basically the sum, sum and substance of the mining process. Now, if you look mining laws and compare with other laws. that it has to be that each portion of the law has to be fulfilled in its letters not in spirit then mining probably cannot be made possible therefore there has to be a fine balance between what is practicable what needs to be given emphasis and which are the areas which need to be looked beyond the laws also underground mining is a very very risky venture here because this is a company with a unique geology unique in the whole world we have 20 overlying seams one after the other and most of the upper seams have been worked most of the upper seams you you know very well because you have been here in the past are on fire every underground mine has at least one or two seams on fire and one or two seams are water locked and we are working under that so you can imagine the kind of risks that are being taken here it is not a normal geological formation of course it's a very different formation at times there has been failure in making proper judgment at times there has been blatant violations of the mining rules and laws uh, this is a chart of accident figures of central zone in 2005 in whole of central zone we had 21 fatal accidents over a long period of time we are noticing that most of the fatal accidents take place due to fall of roof fall of sides that these are strata control issues the problem is because mining is a constant fight against nature where you are you are disturbing the equilibrium of nature there are a lot of decisions to be taken at every step and these decisions sometimes go wrong and when the decisions go wrong maybe a percentage of time they lead to accidents coal miners are underground in more than a literal sense the underworld controls their lives underground fires may be a physical fact but there are fires burning inside the hearts and souls of people many of the original inhabitants of the area have been alienated from their land their forests and their water some of them have been forced to eke out an existence by mining illegally and pilfering coal The undercurrents of tension in the region are palpable even to an outsider. Large sections of the local population comprising low caste Dalits 
and economically backward tribals or Adivasis are often pitted against relatively affluent upper caste non-locals. The district administration, the law enforcing agencies and the public sector management have been engaged in regular skirmishes with politically well-connected gangsters who run lucrative coal and sand transportation businesses, corner construction contracts, conduct money lending operations and organize theft of coal. It's been five days since I returned to Dhanbath after a gap of a quarter of a century. I go back tired but with very, very mixed feelings. For some, the future is indeed as black as the coal that lies beneath the surface of Dhanbath and Jharia. But just like the underground fires which have been burning for 100 years, Within people, I see that fire burning, that yearning for change. There are people here who are wildly optimistic. They believe Dhanbad can become better than not just Kolkata and Mumbai, but even Delhi. But I'm not so sure I share their optimism. ले गई गजब तरंग जमाल 